In this video, I'd like to tell you about a new technology called blockchain. It's kind of this hot new tech buzzword, and it's the technology behind Bitcoin. Bitcoin is really the first big blockchain, kind of started it all. So let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin. Bitcoin was started in late 2008. It was open sourced early the next year, 2009. The organization or group or person that started it called themselves Satoshi Nakamoto. Bitcoin is the first decentralized virtual currency. Now, before I get too much into Bitcoin, I want to talk a little bit about what money is. That's really important to Bitcoin. We use money for basically three things. We use it as a medium of exchange to trade it for goods and services. We use it as a unit of account to keep track of the value of different things in a consistent way. And we use it as a store of value so that I can do work today and down the road, months or years down the road, I can kind of cash in that work as value and have it still be preserved across time. Each of these uses brings with it certain requirements in order for money to be effective for that use. Using money as a medium of exchange requires that it be durable, that it be portable, and that it be fungible, which means that uh, each unit of the same size is kind of interchangeable. If I want to pay for something, we don't want to have to worry that, that the particular unit that I'm using is special in some way. It's just, you know, like a $5 bill. My $5 bill and your $5 bill, they're all just as good. If we're going to use money as a unit of account, in addition to being fungible or homogenous, uh, it also needs to be divisible. It wouldn't be any good if the smallest unit of money was too big to buy a stick of gum or to, to kind of measure the value of a stick of gum. And for a store of value, in addition to these properties, it also needs to be scarce. If I save my money today and between when I save it and when I'm ready to use it, twice as much money comes into existence, the money I saved will be half, the, half as valuable. So I want to make sure that the thing we use as money can't be easily diluted, so it needs to be scarce. <clears throat> there is one more property, and that is that it needs to be acceptable. People have to be okay using it. You have to be able to use it. If I come up with the perfect money all by myself, it's not going to do me much good if nobody else wants it. Let's talk about some of the things that we've used as money. Uh, these are shell necklaces. They're from the Solomon Islands, and they were used for many years as a form of currency. In fact, shells have been used as currency on most continents. They're still a legal currency in Papua New Guinea. Uh, they have paper money too, though. Shells are they are pretty durable. They're very portable. Uh, at least in a format like this, they're easily divisible to an extent, of course. They're not very fungible. If I'm part of a community that uses one kind of shells as money and your community uses different shells, we're going to have a hard time trading unless we can come to some agreement. And they're pretty scarce, but there is a steady new supply of new shells, which could be a challenge to scarcity. Uh, this is stone money. It was made in Micronesia and Guam and transported to the island of Yap for use as currency. These are massive, heavy limestone wheels, and they kind of got their value from the story of how incredibly difficult they were to transfer from place to place and to kind of bring from where they were mined to where they were used. They were kind of passed around, not physically, but just by the story of who owned it. If I wanted to make a payment using these stones, I would just tell people that I was giving my share of such and such stone to somebody else. And that kind of knowledge in the community of who owned the stones was a good substitute for handing the stones over. Stones like these are very durable. Uh, they're not portable at all, but the, this kind of oral history solution sort of sidesteps that problem. Uh, they're not very divisible. 
it, it gets kind of awkward to talk about giving somebody an eighth or a quarter of one of these. Uh, they're not particularly fungible either. If I have a stone and you have a stone, they probably have slightly different values based on their size, their weight, and the history they have. Uh, they are scarce, which is a point in their favor. Precious metals, gold and silver, we've been using these as currency and money for quite a while. Uh, they pretty much check all the boxes. Uh, for certain metals, maybe they're not quite as portable, but but otherwise, precious metals are really good money. Uh, sometimes they're less divisible too. If I have a gold bar, it can be kind of a challenge breaking that up into smaller pieces, but you can make money out of it. You can you know make coins and things like that out of it, and it works pretty good. And then, of course, paper money, which is what everyone seems to be familiar with these days. Uh, paper money used to represent gold and silver, and it was kind of a more convenient way of transacting with gold and silver. Back in 1933, we started going off the gold standard, and in 1971, Nixon shock pretty much ended gold standard completely. And at that point, basically everyone was on sort of unbacked floating money. So it was just paper money that was just symbolic and didn't have kind of precious metals behind it. If we look at the properties of, of cash, it's pretty durable, it's portable, it's certainly divisible, uh, it's mostly fungible. Yeah, I mean, the cash generally has serial numbers on it, that kind of thing. So if, if I happen to be the unlucky recipient of money that somebody jacked from an ATM down the street, there's some risk that I could lose that money and just be uh, out money. But for the most part, cash operates as if it were completely fungible. And the big one is cash is not particularly scarce. The economies these days are driven by debt uh, that go on the government side, and cash is very, very not scarce. So those are all physical items. How do we make a digital currency? We have kind of a difficulty between the physical world and the digital world. If I send you, say, a cat GIF as payment, you're not going to take me seriously because you know I still probably have that cat GIF unless I get, got rid of it. I can just get it again. Digital items don't have this kind of built-in uh, transferability. So we need some way of, of bringing that property on to a, a digital or virtual currency. And that brings us back to the folks on the island of Yap that use these stones. They had kind of a, a mental ledger, and that's what we can use. We can use a ledger. Uh, not this ledger, this one. Uh, we can use a ledger to keep track of how much money each person has. And then to send money, we just you know, say, I want to send money to my friend Jack. We just reduce my account, and we increase his account, just like on PayPal. Unfortunately, this requires trust. We have to have kind of some centralized party who's able to maintain the ledger and keep everything straight. One way that we can reduce the trust that's required for this third party is with cryptography. We can use public and private keys to control the balances and kind of anonymize the ledger. So here's the same ledger that's been encrypted. And now instead of sending payment from the line marked Joshua to the line marked Jack, I use my private keys to control the balances in these two lines that I control. And I send them to the line that Jack tells me to use. And as far as the person maintaining the ledger is concerned, all this is just encrypted traffic and they don't have the keys to alter these balances. It's kind of like secured from them. Now we had a company that did that. They were called DigiCash back in the 90s when everyone was a netizen. They had a centralized ledger. It had cryptographically controlled balances. Unfortunately, people didn't have a, a strong focus on security and privacy and DigiCash had a hard time finding a, a business model that worked for them and they went out of business. And that kind of points to one of the other drawbacks of a centralized provider 
which is they are kind of fragile. They're a single point of failure. So how can we decentralize this, this system where we have a ledger? Well, we just give everyone a ledger, right? Everyone has a copy of the whole ledger. And whenever you have a change to make, you, you send that change out to everybody so that all the ledgers keep up to date. If you see a neighbor who has a longer ledger, they've heard of some transactions that you haven't seen yet, so you just use their ledger. And the network keeps itself up to date. And because we're using these cryptographic private and public keys to handle the balances, nobody else can change my balance on me. Sounds like a pretty good system. We have a new problem now, and that's double spending. Double spending is a problem that we have today in the, in the regular financial system also. If I send a check for my last $100 to my friends, I send two checks out for my full balance of, say, it's $100. They both get the checks. They send me the merchandise. They take the checks to the bank, and they cash it. Whoever cashes that check first gets paid, but whoever cashes that check second has to come chase me down. And that's essentially what you can do with this, this scheme of a distributed ledger. Because the ledger isn't updated for everybody simultaneously, I can tell one group of people over on one side that I'm spending my money at the vendor one, and I can tell people on the other side I'm spending my money at vendor two. And if I time it right, I get goods from both of them before they realize that there's a disagreement. <clears throat> How can we solve that in a decentralized network? Uh, this is an old problem with a cool name. It's called the Byzantine General's Problem. The story goes that the Byzantine army was divided into groups, and each group is led by a general. Unfortunately, some of the generals are traitors. How do the loyal generals share a plan of attack and kind of coordinate their activity even in the presence of this small group of traitors. They're looking for kind of a, a tamper-proof consensus, uh, and that's called Byzantine consensus. Uh, there is a way that we can reach this kind of consensus, even if not everyone on the network is cooperating, and that's using another cryptographic construct called a hash. Hashing is a, a one-way transformation that takes some kind of input, whatever you feed it, and it sort of puts it through a transformation into this random looking output, but it's always, you know, a numerical output that's of a certain length, so they can be easily compared. And that kind of one-way transformation is real fast and easy to do. And whatever you feed in, you get uh, some block of output and small changes to what you feed in completely scramble the output to a new value. It's always the same if, it's, if, it's, if the input's the same, the output's the same. But even if you make a tiny change to the input, you get completely different output. And the key is that you can't go backwards. You can't take that scrambled output and just work out what, you, what was fed in. It's a one-way transformation. And we can use that to get this Byzantine consensus. And there's two places where we'll use a hash. Uh, in 1997, this guy named Adam Back came up with an idea called hash cash. He was trying to find a way to make spam less of an affordable nuisance and more of a, an expensive thing so that spamming would just be too expensive to be practical. And the idea was that when you went to send an email, you would run the email through a hash function, but it wouldn't be just the email, it would be the email and a number. And you would run it through the function and the hash you got out would be this, this long random looking number. And you would keep bumping up the number that you tacked onto the end of the email until your hash gave you something that started with a zero or two zeros or three zeros. And by increasing the number of zeros that were required in your random looking output, you can make the problem harder. 
So if you need, say, three zeros at the end of your, at the beginning of your hash, you just have to keep trying and trying and trying, incrementing that little number one spot at a time until you find an output that happens to have those three zeros or, five, or however many zeros it is. And this is called a, a cryptographic puzzle. And when you get an email that has a hash solution that, that adds up, basically you take the email, you take the number and the hash that they said they got, you check it, one check is real quick. You know for sure that they did that hard work to find whatever the number is that, that produces that many zeros. So this is a way that you can use a hash to prove that you've done some hard work and it's real easy and quick to check. Uh, let's talk about what this transaction log might look like. Uh, a good structure for a transaction log is a linked list. Each block just kind of links to the previous block or points to the previous block. And like we said, everybody trusts the longest sequence of transactions that they've heard about. But we need some way of making this log kind of tamper-proof so that nobody can change history. And what we'll do for that is we'll find a use for hashes here. We're going to change our pointers to the previous blocks to include a hash, and these are called hash pointers. And now, if I change the furthest back item on the list, its hash changes, and that changes the next hash, and that changes the next hash all the way up to the beginning. So if I need to, if I need to be secure and know that, that nobody's messed with the history, I can take my recent hash and I can just check back a few spots to where I've heard about, and I'll know that they haven't tampered with it. But it's pretty easy to do a single hash. So we add to that this proof of work. And now if somebody wants to change history, if they want to mess with the transaction log, they have to redo all the work that's been done in the past up to the current time. And the problem is new work is coming in all the time. People are solving that extra hash pr uh, problem, the, the uh, cryptographic puzzles. They're solving those puzzles all the time and adding new links onto the end of this chain. And so in order to keep up and fake the whole record all the way up to the current time, I would have to have most of the hashing power in the network. And at that point, I might as well just be working for the network. So these two things together, the combination of a hash pointer and proof of work make up a blockchain. We still have the question of why would somebody do all this work? Why would they do all these hashes and calculate out these blocks and, and make the network go? What, are, what is their incentive? Uh, the Bitcoin protocol has a clever solution to this. They kill two birds with one stone. They specify that whoever solves one of these hash puzzles is rewarded with some newly created Bitcoin currency. When you have a transaction log that you're tacking on to the end of this blockchain, uh, one of the things that you put into it is a special transaction called a Coinbase transaction that sends you newly created money just to your address, whatever address you want to send it to. And so everybody wants to compete and try and see if they can calculate just exactly that right hash with the right number of zeros at the beginning. And if they can get it, then they get those new Bitcoins and they have some money. So everybody's competing and trying to solve these problems. This produces a very secure network that's really difficult to attack. Later on, the, the new transactions, the new blocks that come out won't have so much new Bitcoins in them. But one of the things you can do when you're transferring money is you can say, say I have five Bitcoins and I'm sending them to my friend. I'm going to send him, you know, 4.9 Bitcoins, 4.99 Bitcoins maybe and leave a little extra for the miners. And the miners can claim that when they put that together. And that gives them a reason to include those transactions into this log. So that's all well and good. We've got kind of a system set up where we have a way to, a way to transfer value that doesn't require 
a, a gatekeeper. But what does it mean? What can, you know, what's the special thing here? Well, the key is that Bitcoin gives us a way to kind of sidestep this age old requirement that we've had for money, which is the requirement of a, uh, a trusted third party. Trusted third parties are uh, are kind of like they're the thing that makes money. Uh, it's money's biggest remaining weakness. So blockchains provide a decentralized authority and they render trusted third parties totally obsolete. So where are some places that we have trusted third parties now? What are these implications of Bitcoin? Central banks and payment services are the classic example, and this is kind of what Satoshi had in mind when creating Bitcoin, according to the white paper and according to forum posts. The key was to eliminate these trusted third parties and to kind of make central banking and payment services sort of obsolete, give people control of their own money. But more than that, blockchain's value as money is really key to what makes them work. People need to value these these uh, blockchains as money in order to keep mining on them and to keep maintaining the network. So if someone comes up with a use for a blockchain, it needs to also try and be money or, or it could run into some difficulties. Now, this ability to transfer value around the globe without using or trusting a third party, uh, you can save a lot of money and time that way. These third parties have a lot of reason to kind of make themselves as as uh, important and as uh, inconvenient to use as possible so that you'll pay them. And being able to do this in a decentralized way is really kind of wonderful. Uh, there are a number of coins that have kind of as their goal, the use as money, including, of course, Bitcoin. Uh, there's also Dash, Monero, Litecoin, and Ripple. These are some of the most popular coins that, that really say they want to be money. Another use would be as a replacement for a register of deeds or a copyright office or notary, things that talk about, like, this happened at a certain time and place. If you think about this blockchain... It's a, it's a long transaction log. New pieces are being added on all the time. And the pieces that are already on there are, are safe and secure and fixed. So what we can do is we can take some something that we want to prove, like a, a signed document or a photograph of some artwork or something like that. We can run it through a hashing function. And we can take that hash and make it part of a transaction on the blockchain. And then at some point in the future, if we need to prove that our item, our thing, existed at a certain point in time, we can just take the original, run it through the hash function, and look for that hash on the blockchain. And if it didn't exist before a certain date, you know, you can, it's, it's like taking a picture with a photo of the, uh, holding up a newspaper to a video camera to prove a date. It shows that that, that thing existed at that point in time. Uh, a couple people that are doing this are uh, think something called Stampery. Stampery. Stampery uses the Bitcoin and Ethereum Classic blockchains. There's also Factoids and Emmercoin. Uh, another place where we are relying on centralized, uh, trusted third parties is cloud storage providers. Think of Dropbox, for, in for instance. They're essentially a large trusted third party and uh, just a bunch of hard drives. They do a little more than that, but that's basically it. And you can kind of replace them with blockchain-centered solutions. Storage, made safe, SiaCoin, Next are some of the projects that are using blockchains to kind of transform cloud storage. Uh, DNS providers are one of the big pain points for the internet, really, and they're kind of a, 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 a sort of a security weak point on the internet. And we can replace them with a blockchain fairly easily. 
uh, there's two coins right now, Namecoin and Emercoin, that I know of. They're doing this. There are probably others, too. DNS providers are, are a classic trusted third party. That's really all they are. Social networks can be uh, kind of backed by a blockchain. They are essentially just a place where everybody goes for interaction. But if you can find a way to kind of take that network and, and decentralize it, that could be very appealing. Think of the ways that Facebook and Twitter and, I don't know, YouTube have this tendency to kind of exert control over their networks. If you can decentralize that, that's a very appealing platform. Uh, projects I know of that do that are Steam, Scenario, and Akasha, which works off the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, another place where we have centralization is media rights and compensation. If you're a musician and you want to get paid for your music, you basically have to go through uh, either a, a really big company that kind of handles all of this for you or you have to, to kind of like struggle along and do it yourself and that's ripe for disruption uh, there's a project called Ujo Music that uses the Ethereum blockchain it's another project called Library and both of these are focused on uh, media rights and kind of storing media in a way that, that cuts out these trusted third parties Identity providers, think of uh, OpenID, these kinds of things, uh, or, or just think of uh, Twitter, for instance. You often will log in and you'll just associate one of these existing accounts in order to get into a site, and you can decentralize that. No need to trust that third party with your identity at all. Uh, some projects doing that are Blockstack, which uses the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, Namecoin, and uh, hopefully soon, the Dash network also will have uh, this identity possibility. Uh, another use is SSL certificate authorities. It's another point of weakness on the kind of internet infrastructure. Right now, we have to trust organizations like VeriSign. And we're only just now starting to get slightly better solutions with things like the Let's Encrypt initiative. But even that requires that we trust a uh, third party in order to, to make all this work. So these are these are ripe to be disrupted. Uh, some projects that are doing this include Namecoin, Emercoin, and Ethereum. So these are all places where we depend on uh, the trusted third party or where we, we kind of operate as a, a trusted third party. And if you're a business, you can think about maybe areas where your business op functions as a trusted third party and or depends on a trusted third party. So that's uh that's blockchain.